Hey guys, welcome into your lesson for Tuesday, April 21st. Um, as we start talking about the executive branch, uh, just a friendly reminder uh, that I'll have office hours again on Thursday morning. Um, so check uh, Google Classroom for the link to those um, when we get to that, when we get to Thursday. But uh, let's start talking about the executive branch a little bit. Uh, obviously, the head of the executive branch and the biggest focus uh, of the first part of the, of the discussion um, about the executive branch is going to be on uh, the men serving as president of the United States. Um, so really, the focus for most of the first part of the unit is going to be on the president themselves. Uh, and as we get deeper into the unit, we'll talk a little bit more um, about their cabinets, about the executive offices that make up the executive branch, uh, their, their secretaries, their staff, the people that work in the West Wing, so on and so forth. But for most of the first part of the unit, um, the focus is really going to be uh, on the office of president. Um, there are perks to the job. Don't absolutely. Uh, you make about four hundred thousand dollars a year. Plus, you get a retirement a retirement benefit every year thereafter. Um, you have an expense account of one hundred and seventy thousand dollars a year. Um, you get housing and travel provided to you. Play things like um, access to Camp David. Um, you have an office staff, you have a mail staff, and you have a personal staff for life. Uh, you have secret service protection for life. You have top medical care for life, and you are guaranteed. And you are typically guaranteed some sort of presidential library to be built um, in your hometown or in your home state, or really in a location of your choosing uh, after you leave office. All of those perks make the job sound great, uh, and. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a pretty sweet gig. Don't absolutely, but um, it's certainly not an easy job. You you look at a pres a picture of President Obama from uh, inauguration day in early two thousand nine there on the left, uh, and then from shortly before he leaves office, uh, and it's hard to believe uh, that he's he's only aged eight years in that time in that time span. He goes from looking like a very young, very vibrant. Um, young young man to a gray-haired older man that looks a little more worn uh, by the time he leaves office because the demands of the job are, are extremely high. There are three constitutional requirements um, to be president of the United States. The first of which uh, is that you have to be 35 years of age. Um, the second, you have to be a natural born citizen, meaning you have to have been born in the United States. Uh, so for all of you Obama truthers out there. Here's a copy of President Obama's birth certificate. Uh, I know this this conspiracy theory has largely died down in the last five or six years and was pretty hokey and goofy from the start. Um, but you do have to be a natural a natural born citizen. You have to be born in the United States, uh, and you have to have resided in the United States for the last 14 years. Um, you can't you can't go work and or live in in Europe for two decades and then come back and decide you want to run for president. You have to have been living in the United States for the last 14 years leading up to um, your election as president of the United States. Uh, those are the formal qualifications, although over time there have certainly seemed to be informal qualifications as well. Um, of the 45 men that have served as president, sorry, the 44 men that have served as president of the United States, it's, I understand President Trump is number 45, but you have to you have to consider that Grover Cleveland served twice, um, and not in successive terms. So 44 men have served pre as president of the United States. Um, 43 of them obviously have been white. All of our presidents have been males, and all except for um, pre pre up until President Kennedy, all of them have been pro have been, pro have been Protestants, uh, and that, that trend has largely continued. Um, President Trump has probably been the least um, willing to comment or or discuss his religion uh, publicly um, of of pretty much any modern president. Uh, we, it really hasn't been something that has been a, a large focal point of his administration. Uh, he's largely steered away from the question, um, really just leaning on common tropes of Christianity uh, whenever whenever asked or whenever it gets brought up. But for the most part, almost all of our presidents have been Protestant. John Kennedy, a Catholic, uh, being the biggest example, or the biggest example of a non-Protestant, or really the only major example of a non-Protestant president. Um, informal qualifications continue and, and include things like, you know, sometimes it, it helps to look good on camera, right? It really helps that um, when you're, especially in modern politics, for you to be somebody that looks the part on television. Uh, I know that one of the things that I, that I used as an example um, in talking about electability uh, a couple months ago when we were still meeting on a regular basis um, was the way President Trump used his physical stature, his, his sheer height um, to come across as, as the appropriate choice uh, in the 2016 election. Uh, William, William Howard Taft would probably fare a little bit a little bit worse just due to his um, 
portly nature in 2020 because uh, we are so concerned with the physical appearance and the physical stature of the person that that is in that office. Um, you, we typically prefer that person to be fairly intelligent. Uh, I know that um, George W. Bush has taken some flack and, and some jokes from over, over the years uh, for his perceived lack of intelligence. Um, if you go back and you look at the man's um, educational background, I think it's pretty hard to call him flat out stupid. I, I think that's a really unfair um, kind of stereotype to be placed on him, right? When, when your two degrees are from Harvard and Yale, um, you are anything but stupid. Uh, another another significant piece uh, of serving as president of the United States um, comes in comes into into action with the ratification of the 22nd Amendment. Um, so the 22nd Amendment uh, is ultimately ratified in 1951, um, but is a direct reaction to the four the four elected terms of President Franklin Roosevelt. Right. So Roosevelt is first elected in 32. He wins re-election in 36, 1940, and 1944. Um, ultimately, he does not serve all of that fourth term. He dies while in office and Truman finishes the term and, and then runs again um, in 19 in 1958 or 1948, sorry. Um, but uh, the 22nd Amendment 22nd Amendment pretty straightforward is pretty straightforward in that it, it, it limits presidents to serving only two terms. Um, that those don't necessarily have to be successive terms, um, but two terms nonetheless. So um, for instance, um, if Donald Trump were to not be not be victorious in, in this 2020 election and he chose to run again in 2024, he would not be permitted to serve two additional terms. He would be permitted to serve one more term, two total terms. Um, the only uh, exception to that is if you are a vice president that takes over um, for a president that has been removed from office, um, and then it is a 50% mark. So if, if you serve, if you're, if you're, say Gerald Ford in the case of Richard Nixon, and you serve more than 50% of Nixon's elected term, uh, well, then you're only eligible to run one more time. If you serve less than 50% um, of that president's elected term, you would be eligible to, to run two more times and be elected two more times if you're taking over for a president that leaves office. But the 22nd Amendment simply limits the number of terms that a president is allowed to serve, limiting that number to two. Uh, if you'd like to hear something goofy that Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said about term limits and FDR, uh, watch the video. Um, I don't have a ton uh, of nice things to say about AOC. Typically, I think she gets a little goofy, a little wonky sometimes, um, but I thought this video was good for a laugh, if nothing else. Uh, in it, she asserts that the 22nd Amendment was ratified to limit FDR. Well, it was ratified after FDR was already dead, so that is obviously incorrect. Um, really, even before the ratification of the 22nd Amendment, uh, we don't have we don't have any any really good examples uh, of a president running for a third term, um, and it's it's a precedent that is established by Washington um, way back at the birth of the nation. He he serves his first term, he wins re-election for a second term, um, and at the end of his second term. Um, he decides that he's not going to seek re-election for a third term. He absolutely could have. There was nothing in the Constitution that limited how many terms George Washington could serve. Uh, but ultimately, he decides that two, two terms, eight years, uh, is more than enough time for any one person to be in power. Um, and he makes the decision that uh, he's not going to seek, seek a third term. And it kind of sets a precedent moving forward that if George Washington wasn't worthy of a third term or didn't, didn't feel it necessary to run for a third term, um, then who am I? Who am I to break that trend? Who am I to break that precedent? Um, so it's really a precedent set by Washington way back at the birth of the nation that really pushes people away from running for a third term as the president of the United States. Uh, and, and the 22nd Amendment is a really great example of, of a formal change to the Constitution, whereas this precedent established by George Washington that you just don't do it, it's just not something you do, um, is, a, is a good example of informal, informal change to the Constitution. The other, the other constitutional amendment that has a lot to do, particularly with the executive branch and the presidency, um, is the 25th Amendment. The 25th Amendment is ratified in 1967. Uh, and it does a couple of things. One, uh, it, 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 it kind of clarifies what happens if the president leaves office like, and, and in what case, in what cases does that, does that, does that need to take place, right? Like 
we'll get to that here in a minute when we talk about George W. Bush and and going under an anesthetic, uh, going under, sorry, going under anesthesia. Um, but in, in the part of the 25th Amendment says that if a vice presidential vacancy opens up, right, in, in the case of Gerald Ford, he becomes the vice president um, for Nixon because Nixon's original vice president, Spiro Agnew, resigned. So the 25th Amendment, part of what it says is that if the vice president resigns, the president then has to nominate a candidate to fill that spot. The person that is nominated to fill that vice presidential vacancy then has to be confirmed by a majority vote in both houses. So in the case of Gerald Ford, the guy pictured there on your screen, um, when Richard Nixon nominated him to be the vice president after Agnew resigned, uh, Congress had to vote. And basically they, they had to have a majority in the House and a majority in the Senate. Uh, and if they did, which they did, Gerald Ford would be sworn in as the, as the vice president of the United States. Uh, obviously, for that reason and, and for several others, he kind of, he gets this this tagline or this moniker, this nickname as the accidental president, uh, because he goes he goes from relative political obscurity to being president of the United States in an extremely short amount of time. Um, he is nominated for the vice presidential vacancy. He's never elected to that position by by the people. He's nominated by Nixon and confirmed by Congress, uh, and then shortly thereafter. Um, Nixon also resigns uh, while facing an impeachment, an impeachment trial, uh, or possible impeachment trial over the Watergate scandal, uh, and then ultimately Gerald Ford becomes the president of the United States, right? So he goes from relative political obscurity to president of the United States without ever having been elected um, as a member of the executive branch. Only, his only real election, I guess, so to speak, is only real, the only real time people voted on whether or not he was going to be a part of the, ele the executive branch uh, was his nomination process and confirmation process in the, in the U U.S. Congress. Uh, and for that reason, he becomes known as the accidental president. Um, one other issue that I mentioned earlier that the 25th Amendment addresses um, is if the president of the United States is going to temporarily um, be unable to perform the duties associated with the job. Uh, he can temporarily turn over, um, turn over his power, so to speak, uh, ter temporarily turn over his position. There you go. That's the word I'm looking for. Temporarily turn over his position to the vice president until he is, until he is able to resume his duties as president. Um, president Bush famously did this a couple on a couple different occasions, two separate occasions, uh, when he un, when he underwent uh, um, colonoscopies and had to go under anesthesia. In both cases, he writes a letter saying, "Hey, I'm going to be under anesthesia, and as as such, I'm not going to be able to perform my duties as president of the United States. Um, so while I'm under anesthesia and while I'm recovering from this surgery, minor as it might be." Um, I temporarily give president or give power my power to the vice president Dick Cheney. So Dick Cheney becomes the acting president um, temporarily while the president is sedated. Um, it, it's just another clause in the Twenty Fifth Amendment that says the president can voluntarily uh, remove himself from office for for a temporary period, um, and then when he is able to to perform the duties again, take back that power and take back that position. Uh, the Presidential Se Secession Act, passed in 1947, um, establishes what the presidential line of, su of succession is going to look like. So, if the president um, were to be removed from office or were to be or were to pass away, uh, we've had eight presidents die in office. Uh, the vice president um, would take over at that point. Um, does an official move up the list over time? No, that list that list stays pretty pretty locked in. The only the only thing that really uh, has has happened in, in recent years or in more modern American history uh, is we added a cabinet department. We added the, the Homeland Security Department and we just tacked that person's name on the end of the list. Um, that list is able to be altered as necessary, uh, but much like other pieces of legislation, uh, it would need to be altered with another law. So uh, it's possible, but um, it's not particularly likely. Um, if this if the successor is not eligible to be president, then it goes to the next person, right? So if if the Secretary of State um, is not 35, right, then then we would just skip that person in the presidential line of succession and go down to the Secretary of Treasury, right? So if they don't meet the requirements to be president of the United States, they don't automatically get the job. You still have to meet all three of those requirements that I mentioned earlier. All right, another another critical piece to talk about with impeachment. We're going to talk about impeachment here in just a second. We're going to define it, and then we're going to we're going to talk about what um, the three impeachable offenses 
listed in the Constitution are. Right? So first, uh, impeachment is the, the political equivalent of an indictment in criminal law. It, it Being impeached, as you no doubt are aware of at this point, um, given some of the circus stuff from earlier this school year um, that was covered ad nauseum, um, being impeached d does not mean that you're removed from office. Being impeached simply means uh, that the House of Representatives has brought has brought charges against you. Uh, ultimately, that impeachment pr process then leads to the Senate, and the Senate makes a determination as to whether or not um, you are going to be removed from office if found guilty. The three impeachable offenses, uh, treason, is number one. Bribery is number two. And the, the third one is a little more nebulous. It's a little more murky. Uh, and it's other high crimes and misdemeanors. So the three impeachable offenses as listed in the Constitution uh, are treason, bribery, and other high crimes and misdemeanors. Other than the president, other government officials can be impeached. Uh, and this is particularly, as we talked about inside of the last unit, um, this particularly applies to federal judges, right? So federal judges can also be impeached. Members of the House cannot be impeached. It doesn't work that way. Uh, impeachment only applies to the executive branch and the judicial branch at the federal level. Our first test case for presidential impe impeachment uh, takes place in 1868. That is President Andrew Jackson, the man that takes over uh, after President Lincoln is, is assassinated. Um, and the reason for his impeachment uh, is, is he had a real disagreement um, with Congress and particularly uh, when it came to Reconstruction, he had a real disagreement um, Sorry, I just lost my place. There it is. Uh, with radical Republicans about the way that Reconstruction was going to go uh, moving forward, uh, his plan was a little a little more punitive than radical Republicans had in mind at the time. Um, and ultimately, uh, the impeachment charges brought against him are the are the result or the byproduct uh, of a political dispute between him and and a large chunk of Congress. Uh, ultimately, he gets to keep the job. Um, he he does he just. When it gets to the Senate, the Senate does not find does not have enough votes to remove him from office, and, and we're going to talk about what one of the reasons for that was here in a little bit. But ultimately, it boils down to the fact that um, throughout American history, we have not we have traditionally not not viewed political disagreement as an impeachable offense as we should. Um, it, him simply believing being of one party and House members being of another party does not is not room for impeachment. Um, Republicans would probably lobby the same sort of complaints about Democrats right now, right? The fact that you don't like President Trump is not enough to it is an, is not a reason to impeach him. Uh, the same sort of situation kind of existed with Andrew Johnson in 1868. Uh, the Clinton impeachment in 1998, uh, it's the other significant example of when we actually go through uh, a, a, an impeachment trial. Um, the House Judiciary Committee ultimately approves four articles of, of impeachment uh, to be voted on in the entire House of Representatives. The first, perjury before a grand jury. The second, perjury in a separate previous case, one involving sexual harassment. The third, obstruction of justice. And the fourth being abuse of power. Ultimately, the House, the House of Representatives voted to impeach President Clinton on two articles, Article 1 and Article 3. Perjury before a grand jury and obstruction of justice. Um, Article 2 and Article 4, they didn't get enough votes, as you see here. Um, Article 2, not particularly close. Uh, and Article 4, not even not even remotely close. Uh, but Article 1 and Article 3, um, they, they did they did um, pass those articles on uh, to the to the United States Senate. Uh, in the United States Senate, ultimately, um, th this was it was extremely hairy, and, and it becomes extremely close. And, and what you end up with is is on the first charge, um, the first charge he is found gu not guilty by a 55-45 verdict, uh, and on the second charge, um, the second charge being the sorry obstruction of justice charge, um, he is ultimately found not guilty in a 50-50 tie. And obviously, the question then becomes, well. How can you be found not guilty if it's a 50-50 tie? Well, remember who breaks ties in the Senate. The person that breaks ties in the Senate is the Vice President of the United States. So the person breaking this tie would have been George, or would have been, sorry, Bill Clinton's Vice President, Al Gore. So Al Gore ultimately um, becomes that one vote or that President Clinton needed to not be removed. If we had simply had one more United States Senator vote guilty uh, on that 
On that obstruction of justice charge, President, President Clinton would have been the first and at this point only United States president to be removed from office as the result of an impeachment trial. And then our third example, every time we talk about impeachment, everybody, every time the, the impeachment process comes up, everybody wants to talk about Watergate. Well, ultimately, the Watergate scandal and the impeachment trial that is a result of that um, stems from a burglary at the DMC, at the DNC headquarters, the Democratic National Committee headquarters, inside the Watergate Hotel uh, in Washington, D.C. Um, and as part of that burglary, uh, the five men you see pictured here uh, were looking for documents, looking for information, bugging phones, and really just generally engaging in criminal behavior. Um, and that is in June 1972. So Nixon is up for re-election in November of 1972, and five, about five months before Election Day, um, this burglary, this break-in happens. Uh, almost immediately, there is there's at least a little bit of a connection between um, – are, uh, there are some connections being made, I should say, not strong ones, not substantial ones between the break-in at the DNC uh, and President Nixon. Ultimately, President Nixon, uh, or initially anyway, very, very vehemently denies um, having any any link to any part in or any really even knowledge uh, of the of the break-ins at the Watergate Hotel. Obviously, we look at an electoral map from November 1972, uh, and most Americans believed Nixon's denial. Right. This is just five months after the break in uh, and Nixon has denied the heck out of it. And, and most Americans obviously believe him because, well, he wins in a landslide. Right. I mean, it is it's not particularly close. He, he gets almost 61 percent of the vote. So it, it's a pretty it's a pretty big victory at the at the uh, or on Election Day for Nixon. Um, and then. Two reporters from the Washington Post, um, Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward, get involved, uh, and ultimately they start really digging in. And, and that investigative journalism that we talked about earlier in the year when we talked about linkage institutions uh, starts to play a role. And they start to uncover more and more connections between uh, members of, of Nixon's staff and the break-in, maybe potential connections between Nixon himself and the break-in. Um, and then all of a sudden... We finally, after much after much to do and much uh, back and forth, and ultimately uh, the Supreme Court getting involved, um, the Nixon tapes are are revealed uh, and are ultimately made a part of this case. Uh, and and when we figure out when we find out that um, Nixon has been recording phone conversations um, and that there's a part of that tape that is just missing, uh, it. it becomes pretty clear that he probably knew what was going on. He probably played uh, a pretty a significant a significant role uh, in this this burglary at the Water Watergate Hotel. And it leads us to a really interesting U.S. Supreme Court case, the United States versus Nixon, uh, and the idea of executive privilege. Um, during during the back and forth between the White House um, and the and the press and the White House and um, Democrats over what actually took place at the Watergate Hotel, um, President Nixon over and over and over again invokes e executive privilege. Executive privilege basically saying, listen, I'm the president of the United States. I, there, there is, There's really no reason that I should be forced to release all of these tapes. I simply should not have to make public all of the conversations that I've recorded on the phone or that are, that are recorded on the phone that I'm making from the Oval Office. If I'm talking, I could be talking to um, diplomats across the world. I could be talking to members of the State Department about Cold War stuff. I could be talking to anybody about anything, and that information shouldn't be public. I should be able to use executive privilege to not allow any of the tapes uh, of my recorded phone calls be made public or be used um, as part of this this case against me. Uh, ultimately, the United States Supreme Court says, nope, you in fact do not have executive privilege in this case. Uh, and they are extremely clear on, uh, they are extremely clear in US v. Nixon. Uh, the Supreme Court is in deciding that executive privilege um, does not leave, does not leave President Nixon entirely immune from judicial review. He, he is not permitted to just say, well, I'm going to invoke executive privilege. Um, you can't use the tapes. You can't use anything on the tapes. Um, and when this happens, that's when, that's when the part of the tapes goes missing, right? When all of a sudden we have a gap in the tapes, there's, it's, Hey, the, the court said, the court told him that he had to release the tapes, um, f as part of this trial. And then next thing you know, there's a part of the tape, um, that is kind of just destroyed and no longer exists. So executive privilege, um, is not, is not a, 
a, a usable piece uh, or usable tool for the president in, in an impeachment case in, in most cases. Again, ultimately, it is it is the missing portion of the tapes that leads to Nixon kind of seeing the writing on the wall uh, and ultimately um, resigning as president of the United States. So Nixon is not impeached; he resigns before that impeachment takes place. Uh, and and that that idea or this this tagline of "gate," right? For Nixon, it was Watergate. We we uh, we as uh, have we have attached to that. Uh, that suffix onto everything, right? I mean, think about it, even, even not even in Washington, just in popular culture. Uh, if you're looking at uh, the NFL, you got things like spy gate or deflate gate where, Hey, did, did Tom Brady deflate the footballs? As soon as the word gate gets attached to it as a suffix, you know, that it is some sort of big high profile scandal. Wrapping up here, there are there are really four generally agreed upon points when it comes to impeachment. Four things um, that we've kind of all just accepted that this is what kind of these are the thresholds that need to be met when we're talking about impeachment. First, the impeachable behavior does not have to be a crime, right? So if the president is using the office or taking actions in the office, in the best interest of himself, rather than in the best interest of the country, his actions could be grounds for impeachment. Well, what does that mean? Well. If the president chooses not to invade a country or to invade a country only because it's going to personally benefit him, but not necessarily the country, the, the country as a whole, well, in that case, that's not a crime, but his actions might be might be grounds for impeachment. The offense should be grave. A simple poker game, a card game, or any other sort of minor violation of the law um, at the White House, um, on, on, the, on the grounds of the White House, or by just members of the pres of the executive branch as a whole, uh, or, uh, but members of the of the White White House as a whole, don't necessarily constitute an impeachable offense if they aren't s serious charges, so to speak. Um, three, a matter of policy disagreement is not grounds for impeachment. We talked about this with Andrew Johnson earlier. Um, it's the reason that the impeachment case against Johnson ultimately falls apart. It's a disagreement about politics. It's not a disagreement about whether or not what he did um, was illegal, immoral, or otherwise. So don't make it simply a policy disagreement. Uh, and then for, the fourth thing we kind of all agree on is that impeachment is inherently pol political. There's really just not much we can do about that. Uh, the grounds for impeachment ultimately kind of land with Congress, and Congress has the authority um, to decide what they are. Maybe the uh, the impeachment of President Trump is probably the best example of that. Um, the House of Representatives decided that um, – the grounds for impeachment had been met in that case. And obviously the United States Senate d decided that the grounds for impeachment had not been met. So because impeachment takes place in Congress, um, it is inherently political and there just isn't a lot we can do about that because it's not inherent because it's inherently political. It is, these are not a steadfast constant. They can change and they, 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 they probably will over time. So I know that was a lot today, um, I, but I really wanted to dive in. I really wanted to get, get started talking about the executive branch. Uh, we'll continue this conversation tomorrow. Um, if you have any questions, you have any concerns, please send me an email uh, and I will see you all tomorrow.